Hello everyone and welcome to Data Plus Women Germany. I'm very happy that you all could join us tonight. As always, before we start, I'll just say a few words about Data Plus Women, who we are and what we want to do. Data Plus Women actually means Data Plus Women, not Data Minus Men, as Emily Kuhn said last year at the Tableau conference. We aim to give an opportunity to learn and network in the area of data analytics. We hope to unite people of any gender to promote diversity in the data community. And not just any gender, but also any age, academic background, uh, language, or wherever you're from. We're hoping to have at least quarterly meetings, and I'm proud to say that this is our fourth bi-weekly meeting this year. And our next event will be in three weeks on Tuesday, August 4th. As always, you will have the opportunity to join at the very end of this meeting. I, Heidi Kalber, am one of the co-leads of Data Plus Women Germany, together with Gina Konietzki and Corinna Müller, who you will see at other events, maybe. Today, we have Emily Kuhnt talk to us about accessibility and data visualization. After her talk, you will have an opportunity to ask all the questions that you have for her and about the topic she will present. So feel free to make generous use of the Q&A feature that you have here. Um, and afterwards, we will have a couple of announcements and as always, the opportunity for some informal networking. Today's speaker holds a very special place in my personal journey in the Tableau community. I first got in touch with Emily roughly two years ago uh, at the Tableau Fringe Festival. The Tableau Fringe Festival is a virtual conference from the community for the community, and it's aimed to spotlight people at the very edge of the data community. The TFF was my personal first step into public speaking and into my journey with the community engagements. Over the years, I've found touch points with Emily again and again, whether it was her co-hosting the Tableau Wannabe podcast or the Tableau, uh, or the, sorry, Data Fam Community Jam. I admire Emily both as a community leader and as a businesswoman, and I can say that she ranks very high on my list of people that I want to be like when I grow up. Emily has inspired me again and again over the last two years, giving me a platform to inspire others. And as such, I am very excited to be able to give her a platform today so that you all may be inspired by her as well, if you don't know her yet. So it's my utmost pleasure to have her with us tonight. And with that, I'm handing over to you, Emily. Well, first of all, thank you so much. That was so nice. I'm not usually a crier, but oh, onions in here. <laughs> so thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a while since I've been in front of the screen like this. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, share my screen and get started here. Um, so today I'm talking about accessibility in data visualization. And really, I have meant this as a primer um, just because um, I really feel like I have a little bit of knowledge on this that I want to share with others because it may not be something that's in the forefront of what we think about when we're um, developing data visualizations. So um, shameless plug here, use the hashtag accessible viz uh, because I'm trying to build a, kind of a movement around this, um, but it'll help me identify and keep track and uh, connect with you all. So today is really a primer, and as we go through, we'll see why I've kind of set it up as a primer. Um, I want to, before I even get into my slides, I want to share with you this uh, graphic that you see on the right side of my slide, and that's the persona spectrum from Microsoft. I discovered it through some of my research and readings that I was doing. I think it was on um, st uh, storytelling with data's um, blog that Amy Cecil had put together. And I really loved this because what it shows is that accessibility, like how we think about accessibility has changed. And I'll share a little bit about that as we get into it. But there, the way that Microsoft is looking at it is, you know, there's touch, um, sight, hearing and speaking and how there can be permanent conditions, um, temporary and situational. So it gives us something to think about as we um, put together our visualizations. 
All right, <clears throat> so what we're talking about today. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what accessibility means and what it is, some of the requirements, um, simple ways to make your data visualizations more accessible, and the challenge ahead. But before we get into that, I'm Emily, and I'm your guide today for accessibility and data visualization. And so you may be thinking, well, like, how does even this, like, how does this come up? How, how did you get into this? And it really started in 2010. Um, back and in those days, I was a bank examiner and moved into our headquarters unit to help administer systems. And as part of that, um, I had the responsibility of being the business system administrator for this reporting system called Comparative Analysis Report. And we were rebuilding it. And as we were rebuilding it, our IT project manager at our weekly status meeting told us, you know, I've had a visit from our 508 coordinator and what we're doing is not, it, it doesn't comply with 508. And so I'm like, well, what is 508? And that really started my journey in understanding some of the challenges. And this was an application that was being custom built. So it was being built from the ground up. And so I really got to understand some of those challenges in developing an application and making it accessible to individuals. Um, and it was really interesting to me because there was some room for interpretation. So as a bank examiner who likes checklist and regulations and definition, that was kind of on the edge. And so I wanted to understand that because I wanted, to, I wanted our application to be 508 compliant. And I'll get into like what 508 is. So that's my perspective from a work background but then recently, as, as really I was starting to put this together, I really thought about, well, I'm like, like why do you care? <laughs> like, so what? All right, that was like 2010, <laughs> it's 10 years later. Um, so why do you care? And I really think about kind of how this has impacted my life. And as we think about it, I'm sure you know other people that it impacts as well. And so I think about my daughter who is dyslexic and has, um, as we call it, defocusing issues, <laughs> um, but it, she has a little bit of inattentive ADHD. Um, and with dyslexia, she has trouble decoding. And I think about another family member who is losing his sight and how you know, he's having to increase the font size. He's having to take some accommodations, make some accommodations in his life to be able to do the things that I can do on a normal basis. And so my introduction was from a work perspective, but the reason why I still care about it is because I want as many people to see our work because we put a lot of time and effort and I believe that as data visualization practitioners, we care about what we're doing. We care, we want people, as many people, to see our message, to see the data's message. And so that's why accessibility has been something that I have been interested in and have really dabbled in, in terms of like understanding or having conversations with folks in the Tableau community or folks at Tableau, since I started becoming active in the Tableau community. So that's a little bit about me and how I got here today. So what does accessibility even mean and what is it? Well, really, it is more than colorblindness. I think a lot of times that's the one that people think about the most, probably because it is the most talked about. And I think it's probably the easiest to solve for. But in addition to colorblindness, there's just general blindness, being um, the inability to see visual information. Limited vision, you can see, but not very well. People are deaf, they can't hear sounds reliably. There's low dexterity. They're unable to use a pointing device and they need to use a keyboard or a switch. Uh, people with low comprehension, so understanding content. And low reading, so having problems reading the text. And then epilepsy, and this is somebody who's subject to epileptic episodes. 
say that three times fast. So those are some, and I'm sure that this is, there's more to this list than what I have listed here, but that gives you some idea of what accessibility is. So I want to share with you because I don't know about you, but if you've heard about accessibility or colorblindness, or you say, or you hear about, well, there's a screen reader, unless you experience it, you may not have a full appreciation or some additional appreciation for what that is like. And so I um, just, I've used this YouTube clip that I found and I want to share it with you now. So just give me one second while it loads. Out of table Chestnut Hill. Oops. There we go. Find regional rail schedule heading level one. Weekday bar to center. Effective January. Visited link vertical layout bar. Link desktop. Link reverse trip. Table with 15 rows and one columns. This table shows schedules for a selection. Regional rail schedule weekday to center city Philadelphia. Listed in the columns. Row one column one train number dash dash greater. Edge of table. Edge of table. Train number dash dash greater. Zone station name. Row two two. Edge of table. Two link Chestnut Hill East. Out of table this table shows schedules for a selection of key stops on the route for Chestnut Hill East Line Regional Rail Schedule Weekday to Center City Philadelphia. Stops and their schedule times are listed in the columns. Table with 15 rows and 25 columns this table shows schedules for Regional Rail Schedule Weekday to Center City Philadelphia. Listed in the columns. Row 1 column 1 705. Column 2 707. Okay so now I'm actually in the table. So that is just a little bit of what a screen reader is like and how it reads and so it really is reliant upon what is in the cells and what's in the blocks the columns and the rows to um, as to what it'll read and if you noticed that little dash dash greater sign like it actually said dash dash greater sign uh, whereas we would normally interpret that as an arrow so um so that's just one Little, in, little peek into a screen reader. Um, I don't have a screen reader or else, like I actually wanna get one so that way I can experience it a little more and be able to fully understand how to use a screen reader and visualizations. But I thought that that was a really nice clip of, and the clip is actually longer, but a really nice insight into um, how fast it can go and reading all of the cells. So it can be very, um, it can be a lot of information to take in. So what's required? Um, I was talking about Section 508, but we also have this thing called WCAG, and that's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So there's really four principles when it comes to WCAG. It needs to be perceivable, perceivable operable, understandable, and robust. So perceivable means that the user can identify content and the interface. Um, I'm just making sure I get this right. Um, and operability means it can use successfully use controls and buttons and navigations. Um, so that might be like voice commands or keyboard navigation. Understandable means that it needs to be consistent in the presentation and the format, predictable in the design and usage patterns. Um, it, people should be able to understand the content and learn and remember how to use the interface. And then robust really gets to the technology piece of it, like um, so that the technology supports this. Uh, so it gives us the ability to interact with websites, online documents, multimedia, and other formats. So that's POR, the four principles of WCAG. But then there's Section 508, and if you're based in the US, this is what applies. Now, section, it's Section 508 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And in general, the act says that you need to make reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. That's a super high level. I should also like put a little like a lawyer cap on for a second and just say, these are my interpretations and my understanding um, of the laws and regulations. 
Um, so please do not take that as like legal advice and check with your compliance department. That sounds very formal. But I don't think it'll hold up um, with your compliance departments if you say, well, because I'm like said so in the um, presentation. So Section 508 was rewritten not too long ago. And um, what it was written, uh, the way it was rewritten, was that it was really written to comply at that WCAG level AA, which means it's meeting more than just the minimum requirements. And the reason why they did that in term, as far as I understand it, is so that way it could be universally applied and you wouldn't have to worry about um, you know, having different like lower standards in the US than other parts of the country or other parts of the world. So that's Section 508. Section 508 actually is primarily, uh, as far as my understanding is, if my memory serves, is primarily for federal agencies. Um, but it also applies to companies that do business with federal agencies. So this would be like if a contractor developed reports or dashboards for a federal agency, their work would also have to comply with Section 508. And it really gets to um, electronic content. And that was part of the rewriting of Section 508 was to really have a a broader scope versus just the, the way it was previously written, which was sorely outdated. So I mentioned that 508 really is that level A and level AA. And so I found this matrix, which I thought was super helpful and I wanted to share with you all today because it has the principles, the four, the, the poor, the four principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, as well as the guidelines. And it, it identifies level A and level AA, as well as level triple A. I'm going to focus primarily though on level A and level AA because those are what are also required for section 508. Now, um, I think it's a little ironic that we're talking about accessibility and the text here is really hard to read. So I'm actually going to go back over to the internet where this uh, matrix is. And I think this is a little better um, but I'll also, this is also in my resources section for you as well. Um, so what level A requires is that there's a text alternative for non-text content. Um, I'm just going to kind of walk through a few of these things. Um, so that way you can get an idea of what the requirements are. That um, if you have time-based media, that there's an alternative to video or audio only content, that you've got captioning. Um, adaptable, meaning that there's a logical structure, so things are presented in a meaningful order. Um, let's see, when it comes to distinguishable, you're not using a presentation that relies solely on color, and um, you don't play audio and animations automatically. In terms of operable, this is where you get into keyboard accessibility, so it needs to be accessible by the keyboard, and you don't trap keyboard users. Um, Sometimes with what I found when I was part of that um, administration group developing that application, you know, the keyboard, the tab, 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 um, depending on, you know, what you're doing and how many things you need to tab, it can really um, be a little overwhelming. And then you've got to figure out how to go back. So I think it, some of these things also work together. So you know, not trapping the keyboard users, but having things presented in a meaningful um, fashion, uh, orderly fashion also helps. Um, providing users controls for enough, uh, to allow for enough um, time to do their work and for moving content. When it gets to operability and seizures, so this epileptic, epileptic excuse me, episodes, no content flashing more than three times per second. Um, <clears throat> readable, specify the language on each page, um, clearly identify input errors, um, build elements for accessibility. So those are basically some level A requirements. Level uh, AA 
have live video with captions. Um, users have access to audio descriptions for video content. Um, content ratio between text and background is at least four and a half to one. A text can be resized to 200% with, without the loss of content or functions. Um, keep menus consistent, icons and buttons are used consistently. So those are just some of the requirements, but I love this matrix. I thought it was really good. Um, and what I've also done is I've taken the level A and double A just at a minimum and put it into a checklist because again, I'm a checklist kind of gal. And if it helps anybody, then I have it in a checklist that it's in the resource section. So I'm gonna hop back over to the presentation. So now what I want to do is to tackle some of those aspects, some of those accessibility considerations. I'll start out with colorblindness um, because that is one that is generally talked about the most. For me, um, I like using VizChecker, which is what we see here on the screen. Um, there are two primary approaches that I personally use. One is to use a colorblind friendly palette. The other is use a high contrast red and green. Um, personally, I love the high contrast red and green because it allows us to play off of the color associations we already know, like green is good, growth, um, go, red is danger, loss. So depending on the data, that could be a really effective color palette to use. And so I have both this red and, uh, I'm sorry, the blue and orange, that's part of, at least in Tableau, that's part of their Tableau um, colorblind palette. And then I have just two colors that I tend to use when I am doing something, um, especially with money, if I'm trying to show any type of um, spectrum in terms of good or bad. And I've got my light green and my dark red. And we can see through this color check, uh, this vis checker, uh, we can simulate the type of color vision and really see what it looks like before we publish it out to the rest of our organization or to the public. So that's colorblindness in terms of using uh, a colorblind friendly approach. Now, one of the things that I actually had somebody come up to me one time as I was talking about colorblindness in my organization that I used to work for. And with colorblindness, I, I think, if I remember correctly, I think it's about 8% or so of men um, have some type of color deficiency. And so somebody asked me, they challenged me on it and said, okay, Emily, you're focused on the 8%, but what about the 92%? So like, why do this when 92% of the people can see it? And that's where I think we dig in. Like, I love that conversation. I loved that conversation because it really allowed us to talk about why it's important um, and not just play the numbers or the percentages, but you never know unless you truly know your audience. Um, you know, you know every individual in there, but you never know who's in that 8% because it's not like people are just going to wave a flag saying, hey, I have this accessibility issue, I'm colorblind. Like you don't know that um, and you shouldn't be asking uh, because of HIPAA or other health privacy laws. So you don't know um, in general, if you're um, developing something, you, do, you may not know who has, who has a color deficiency or color blindness. And so you want to, again, you wanna create work that as many people can see as possible. So, um, you know, changing up the color palette or double encoding, those type of approaches, like in the grand scheme of things, is it that big of a deal? I don't think so. But the thing that I love more than anything is that um, a team that I was on, we were working on a visualization. I was um, representing the business, uh, not the Tableau developer work at that time. And we presented something and we had a senior advisor come up to us afterwards and say, you know, this was the first time like I actually saw what was being displayed on the screen because he said, I'm colorblind. And usually I just like look at it, I look at the screen and I'm like, okay. And then I follow up later to make sure I understand like actually what people were looking at. He was like, but this was so cool. Like I could actually see it. And 
that was amazing because we had a standard on our team of doing work that was uh, colorblind friendly. So that is just a really great example. We didn't know that that person had a color deficiency. So that's why you do it. It's not for the other 92%. The next thing that I want to share about is low vision. So in here, font size and font choice matter. <clears throat> so I, this is from a Tableau sample data uh, workbook. And all I did was I changed the header on that back image to be a smaller font. Um, you really couldn't tell that it's a header image, really. Um, so, but it's still readable. And then in the uh, more forward-facing image, I made it very pretty script, but it's also kind of hard to read. And so you want it to be as readable as possible. So avoiding those script fonts and going with something very legible. Um, and side note, one of my son's teachers actually sent us an email and for some reason it was in all script. It was so hard to read and I have pretty good vision. So, oh, <laughs> um, but it's always good to stay away from those scripty decorative fonts. And I'll talk about in my tips section what fonts you can use. Um, in addition for low vision, contrast here matters. And it's not just for colorblind folks. You know, we talked about the high contrast for the color palettes. I mean, just in this dashboard, if my numbers going across the screen were in a light gray, it matches my map really well but it's also really hard to read. So again, having that contrast there is super important. All right, so I've taken some of those considerations that I talked about in terms of like what accessibility is, what it like kind of how it shows up. And I just have this very simple table of ways that we can also solve for it. Now this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list, but just to kind of give us a start. So if somebody is blind, then a screen reader or voiceover may be a really great way to solve for that. If somebody's colorblind, then using contrasting colors or double encoding. Oh, I've got a little mistake there, I'll fix. Um, if somebody has limited vision, select a readable font, use white space. If somebody is deaf, um, consider using a visual display, don't rely on audio or use captioning. If somebody has low de dexterity, where they're not able to use a pointing device or a mouse, um, make it accessible with the keyboard. If they have low comprehension, annotation can help. If they have low reading, so problems reading the text, consider using high contrast um, colors, but uh, also the font choice here matters. And if somebody has epilepsy, then um, the way you would solve for this is not to have more than three flashes per second. All right, so like in action, what does that mean? So alt text your images. So I have this map here, and if I were to download this image, um, it would be whatever, when I use Tableau, the, it downloads as to what my worksheet name was. But in this example, I just said image one demo because how many times do we get like dashboard one or something really generic? So a screen reader would read something like image one demo, which tells me nothing about the map that's on the screen. So alt texting or providing that text, that descriptive text, sales by geography in the continental US kind of sets the stage is a little more descriptive. So, the takeaway here is a screen reader reads the description of the image, so make it informative. So another actionable tip for accessibility, contrast your colors. So I found this tool when I was doing my research for this presentation. Um, it was on the Storytelling with Data article. So the takeaway here is contrasting colors help people see. So we have, actually I have three different types of contrast. Um, I have one that's that green button that is like, that's really solid, that's good to go. The orange is more of a caution and the red is, it would fail WCAG standards. So let's take a look at this tool for a second. I think it's super cool. 
All right, so it's called contrast ratio. I have it in my resources section if you're new to this, like I was, but super awesome. I wish I had my brand colors here, although I've tested them out so I know that they work. Um, okay, so I've got white and I'll just tab over and I'll say teal, which is one of my brand colors. So it's green. And what that means, if I hover over this button, it says that it passes the AA standard for any text, any size text, and AAA for large text, so 18 point or, uh, or bold above 14 point. So that's pretty cool. So you can go in here, you can put in your corporate colors, um, you can look to see if you're developing a visualization, what that contrast is really, like how good it is. So I thought this was super awesome. Um, so if I put white and yellow, 1.07, it fails with the little sad face. Um, if I were to do red and green, that is so hard. It is so hard to read on my eyes. Um, and that fails the WCAG 2.0 standards. And so it gives you the precise contrast. It has the relative luminance, which if I were to go back to my color um, knowledge, really dig deep, I'd remember what that is. But I thought that this was such an amazing tool to figure out um, what color combinations to use. All right, so another tip is to use white space. Now, for a lot of us who are using stacked bars, we just stack it and go about our day. But if we have a white border around, then it really divides it up and helps chunk out the data, which helps people see and understand it a little better. So that's another actionable tip you can take into consideration. So the white space helps detect differences. Now, when it comes to fonts, like I love fonts and color, that's, that's my jam. Um, font choice and how we construct sentences matter. So which font should you choose? Um, I got this from webaim.org. It's an amazing resource I would recommend that you all um, take a look at. But Arial was a very popular recommendation when I was doing research and then I came across this article and it said, well, Arial is good, but look how it can be confusing. And this illustration was a, a great illustration of it. So that I and the L's kind of look the same, whereas with Verdana, it's a capital I and you can see the difference in the letters. And so it makes it clear, which makes it easier to read. So, okay, so we've got Ver, uh, Ariel and Verdana. The other thing with Verdana is that it is spaced out more. I believe that's the tracking if memory serves. So it's spaced out more. Again, easier to read, it's not so condensed. But if you don't want Verdana because it's too spaced out, then Tahoma could be a really good alternative for you. And so I really like that they also included this comparison of Arial, Tahoma, and Verdana um, to help us figure out what kind of font to use. So when you are thinking about your um, fonts, Think about um, which one can uh, accommodate increased text sizes without the loss of readability or functionality, which one is easier to read. Um, the other thing that I'll also, and it gets to the construction of sentences, or at least the way I think about it, is that it's really helpful if you have line spaced at one and a half versus one. Even when I was putting this together, my keynote default was 0.9, so I would change it. So everything in the takeaways with that black and yellow is at a one and a half times, and that makes it easier to read. All right, so some, another actionable tip for accessibility. Um, I just literally typed in complex data visualization, and this was one that was pretty that showed up. Um, I didn't dig into the visualization, so <laughs> I don't exactly, I think, actually it was just an example of something. Um, but if we look here at this visualization, it is, to me, it's beautiful. But it's really hard to understand exactly what it's about. And so if we're thinking about people who um, have difficulty comprehending, they could get really lost in this. 
And here's why this matters. I mean, this visualization, you might say, well, Emily, I mean, this visualization is pretty complex. True. But here's the thing. I remember being in a class. Um, my organization was really big on continuing education. So I was in this class around interest rate risk modeling. And they presented a graph and they were like, and this was before my data visualization days, but even still, I'm not sure if I, how great or timely I'd be at understanding it. But they presented this graph and they were like, okay, what does this mean? And everybody else in the class was getting it. And I just sat there like, oh my God, I feel like the stupidest person in the world because I don't understand what this means at all. I am way over my head. I shouldn't be in this class. And so it starts giving you this, um, I mean, it can be a confidence issue for one, but then it can just be really hard to understand. And so one of the ways that you can solve for that is through annotation. So I just made up this annotation that could be like a title or a subtitle. Um, but I just made this thing up that uh, this annotation up that says, hey, the West Coast switch causes a bubble up of issues in California and other states. Um, and so at least I have an idea of what's being talked about. Like I, uh, then I can start to dig in more. I can start to feel more comfortable with it. So that's another tip for accessibility. So providing annotation helps a reader understand. And then when it goes, when it comes to te testing flashes, now, this may be less in a workplace setting, but um, I wanted to provide it just for kind of completeness. So this is a tool that Windows window users can use. And if you have Mac, I think they say to run bootcamp. I don't have that set up on my Mac, um, but I wanted to share it out with you so that way at least you were aware of it. And so you can upload your image or movie, uh, your file, and it will analyze whether it passes or fails a threshold of the number of flashes per second. And so then you would be able to see whether this uh, was, should be used in your work. So the takeaway here is ensure any flashes in your data don't cause health issues. Um, I'm not sure how frequent somebody might use this, but I wanted, again, I wanted to provide it just for completeness. And because I think it is pretty cool that there's a tool out here that can help us do that. And I have the um, link for that in the resources section. All right, another t actionable tip for accessibility, simple is better. So, you know, how many times, if we've taught Tableau or data visualization, you know, we have the, this great case of this like, schedule of numbers and you know point out the most like the biggest and the lowest and we can get really overwhelmed with just this sea of numbers and that's why visualization works so well but the other part of that is remember back to that septa youtube example that clip that i showed where the screen reader is reading you know 396 218 127 77 48.7 31.7 like after a while like how well is your comprehension of what's trying to be communicated? And so a lot of the readings that I, a lot of the research that I've read says, if you can aggregate it up, then do so. So while it may look visual, like it may be amazing to see this spark line or this line uh, graph that has like a bajillion <laughs> data points, which is cool. It can also be really difficult for somebody to get a, an alternate view of that in a text table and to go through and read all of that. So aggregating it up, going for simple, um, that is one of the actionable tips for accessibility. All right, so I've talked a lot about what it is, um, how, what are some of those actionable tips we can take in our everyday um, work, but I know that there are challenges. Interactivity is a big one. Can a screen reader read it? The hover over um, tool tips, they can be really challenging. Chart types. It's very easy to translate a bar chart, a line chart, a pie chart, all of that into a text table. When we use different 
chart types like network diagrams, for example, there aren't as, they are not as easy to translate into a table. So then how can you make that more accessible? And then I, I put in here, I think big data, um, having actually, I should say lots of data. Um, it's overwhelming with so many numbers. Um, so how, how do we get around that when we need to provide that level of detail? So these are challenges that we need to find a balance and solutions for. And this is my invitation to you. We have challenges in the accessibility space, but I believe that as a community, we can find solutions. And so what I'd like to do is to organize a, an accessibility showcase or hackathon. Um, and if you're interested, I would love for you to participate. The link is right there. Um, I think that it would be a really cool way of seeing examples of accessible work. And I actually would love to have people talk about their process and how they ended up with their end product, how they solved, like what accessibility challenge they solved for. Um, you know, I have continued to do some research on it and I still, there still isn't like a lot of great articles out there, a lot of them anyway, when, from my search on interactivity. So how can we progress and how can we meet that challenge? So this is my invitation to you if you're interested. Um, it's just an interest form. And so I'd love to be able to organize something around that because I think the more examples, the more we can see what it looks like and how we can solve for it. Um, I think that it helps spread accessibility across organizations. All right, so <laughs> I will give, um, I'll give Heidi the copy of my slide deck because I have like two pages of resources that I uh, was relying upon or read or wanted to bookmark. And so <laughs> here you go. Um, I also, um, I also want to just talk about a couple of things. One is that Tableau, um, if you're using Tableau, they go through a VPAT, which is a voluntary um, accessibility, um, the name is escaping me at the moment, but it's a voluntary review of accessibility for their um, tool. And so they've partnered with Equal Entry to, uh, go, th to go through that. Um, the VPA, the, this article talks about kind of where they're at, what they tested, um, and so it's a really good read on just kind of about that process for Tableau. Um, the other thing though is that, and the last time, the, the last VPAT I saw out on the internet was from 2018. So there may be a more um, current one. I'm checking in on that. If you're using Tableau and you're curious about the VPAT and what tool, what aspects of the tool are accessible, which are not, what, so it gives you kind of a idea of where they're at. So there was a 2018, but the tool has changed so much since that time. I did not include that as a reference. Um, and then I have just that accessibility checklist. Right now, it's just the WCAG um, standards for A and AA. Um, but I think I might add another page to this and just go through some of the ways to solve for some of the accessibility um, considerations I talked about, just to give people a starting point for making sure that their work is accessible. All right, so that, those are my resources, and um, I'd love to connect. Uh, I don't do a lot of visualizations anymore because I'm teaching or hosting um, and providing people platforms, but this is something that is really near and dear to my heart in terms of data visualization, and so I love to talk about it, and I love learning about it too. So I'm happy to continue the conversation. You can always email me. That's my email address, emily at emilycoon.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. My handle is at emilycoon, or you can, I try to be really fancy and use a QR code, which links to my Twitter. So either one of those should work. All right, that's what I've got for you today. Um, I'll stop sharing and um, let's see, I'll dig into some of the questions and answers. 
That was great, Emily. Thank you so much. So our first question was from Sidel, and he was asking whether Section 508 applies for websites that are not public sector. Yeah, so 508, I think it still applies for the government. However, WCAG is beyond government. And so really, I would rely on WCAG. Um, and again, this gets into what's, what's the minimum requirement and what should you do? So um, I would say you should comply with WCAG, even though 508 may not um, apply to your organization. All right, thank you. And then tying into the color combos you talked earlier, are there any color combinations that you personally avoid? Yeah, so I avoid um, I avoid yellow and white. Um, I avoid that bright red and green that, that I showed on the color contrast tool. But otherwise, it, it really depends on the the data and the situation. Um, so it, it really, and what I also try to do, and this was more when I was working in the public sector and doing um, visualizations for my job and leading a team of analysts, was that I would just try, and I didn't include this in the tips, although it's a good one, to keep the colors consistent. So anytime I was talking about central, that was light blue. Anytime I was talking about the Northeast, that was a certain shade. So that way um, it made sense and my users knew uh, every quarter when I would put out that book, what those color combinations were. So uh, it really depends on the data. I think high contrast is where it's at. Um, you can't go wrong there. Um, and yeah, it, it really just depends because like blue and red, I wouldn't use that now unless I was going to visualize political data because we're in an election year and in the US. And so I would just be mindful of how people might interpret that. That's an it depends kind of answer. I know that in the community there's a discussion going on on uh, day mode versus night mode dashboards. I know that I personally always tend to create night mode dashboards in my free time, but day mode dashboards for my work. Any any take on that that you have? Um, you know, I from some of the reading that I've done, there are some studies to show that the night mode isn't as effective as people think. I, you know, I think it goes to what is your audience? If it's something for you and it's easier on your eyes, then do it. Um, so that's kind of where it's at. I also think about, again, so much, of, a lot of this is an it depends, but it really gets back to know your audience. Like so much of this is know your, know your audience. So if I know that my audience is a bunch of IT professionals and they, I know that they are looking at applications with dark backgrounds, you know, whatever. So then I would probably use a night mode or a dark background to visualize information because that's what they're accustomed to. And anything else would be really jarring for them. So, um, I would go back to what is your audience uh, need and use that use that approach and just use the color contrast. So like a white or a light gray, if you're using a dark background or yellow, you noticed in my presentation, I opted to use yellow because the high contrast there for the takeaways was really good. So that's, that's my thought on that. I heard a very interesting presentation at TC Europe last year where they mentioned that one of their night mode dashboards failed because people were trying to print it out and nobody will print a dashboard with a black background. <laughs> yeah. So we actually had that situation in my organization one time where they created this very beautiful dark background. But at the time, we were still printing out. Um, we, we were printing things out. And so I'm like, so before they could even get that published, I was like, you can't do that. You've got to switch it to white background because people will print this out and think about all of the toner that people will, or all of the ink that people will use, and it's going to end up costing more money. So even though it's beautiful, switch it. 
and they did. And now their the organization is at a point where they don't print as many things out anymore, is my understanding. So that's a cultural, like an organizational cultural thing as well. Yeah. You talked about fonts earlier. What is your take on serif versus sans serif fonts? Don't know if I pronounce it right, but yeah, I you get what I'm saying. Yeah, you're right. Um, so I always have to go back. Like I have to look at the examples of what a, a serif and sans serif is. So sans serif, I think, is without the like fancy edge. Yeah. Um, I and the recommendation. So this isn't just my thought, but the recommendation is to use a sans serif because it just makes it easier to understand. So that's why things, that's why text or fonts like Arial, Verdana, um, Tahoma work really well. Trebuchet is another example of a font that is pretty good, but it has just that little notch on the end. So sometimes it can be a little hard to read. And that's why text or fonts like Times New Roman while it was great in print for the longest time, it is not a great font to use. So that's the, uh, the advice on fonts and serif and sans serif. Great. Do you think, like, what's your take on how, how can we check ourselves for ableism? You talked earlier about that one conversation where somebody asked, okay, why do we care about the 8% when there's 92% of people who are perfectly fine? So how can we check ourselves for that? You know, I think it's, um, I think it's more of a mindset thing, honestly. It's thinking about, do I know, again, knowing my audience, do I know, like really know, not assume, do I really know who my audience is? Because nobody's going to wave a flag unless they're just really open to talk about whatever permanent, temporary, or situational issue they have. So you never know who's the way I think about it, who is in that 8% for that color um, deficiency, that colorblind friendly visualization we did. It was somebody who was an advisor. He was influential. I, but there's also another senior official who is colorblind, who is a decision maker and pretty high up because I was in a really flat organization. So you never know who's in that 8%. Are they a decision maker? Well, if they can't read your stuff, sucks to be you. Like, that's kind of harsh, but at the same time, you need to accommodate as many, have a reasonable accommodation for as many people as possible. And that's, so that's how I think about that 8%. That's a great take. Thank you so much. You, we learned, I think we all learned so many interesting things today. Um, so thanks for that very important delve into um, accessibility. Well, I am so thankful um, that I had the opportunity to speak to y'all and happy to connect with anybody outside of this forum to talk about it more. That's great. Okay, I will share my screen just once more to announce our next meetup. So our next event, again virtual, will be three weeks from today on Tuesday, August 4th. We will have Daria Voronova and she will talk about the power of freedom that lives within or how to find your authentic path and make your dreams come true. So she will talk about her personal journey, um, becoming a data analyst and finally founding her own company and about all the struggles and successes that came with it. So I hope you will all join us then. I know we're cutting it very close to the full hour. So if anybody has to drop out and that goes for you, Emily, as well. Um, feel free to do so. The official part of the event is over, but if anybody wants to stick around for some informal networking, um, please feel free to do so. I will stop the recording in a bit and then everybody who wants to um, can stick around and I will make you all panelists so that we can turn on our cameras and just have a brief chat or any questions that you might have. To all the others leaving us today, thank you so much for joining and I hope to see you in three weeks on August 4th. Good night. <laughs>